Yeah, good morning, uh, guys. It's Acts chapter 17, wonderful chapter that we're up to this morning. Um, we've made our way through the book of John and the book of Acts, and the gospel is preeminent all the way through. I'm going to bring you in to the, uh, <clears throat> the New King James Version here. Uh, and this is uh, the Apostle Paul and Silas. And you remember in chapter 16, and we'll go back there, uh, they were thrown into prison. Paul had uh, delivered a demon-possessed girl who had spirit of divination. And when her master saw that uh, she wasn't going to earn them any money through this anymore, they dragged Paul and Silas before the magistrates, the, uh, the judges, uh, who had them beaten and put in the prison. And as they were singing hymns in the inner prison at midnight, then a earthquake came and uh, all their chains were, were uh, uh, dropped off them. And uh, the, 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 the prison guard, the, uh, the guy who was in charge of the prison, drew his sword because he saw all the, all the doors open and everybody's chains gone. Uh, and uh, he was going to kill himself. Um, but uh, Paul said, no, no, don't do that. We're all here. And uh, the upshot was that uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the keeper of the prison um, fell down before Paul and Silas and said, what, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to them. He washed their stripes. They, they'd been beaten with rods, probably 39. Uh, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Notice how quickly the baptism takes place. Anyway, <clears throat> in the morning, the uh, magistrates send and say, uh, you can release those men. And Paul says, oh, they quietly want to release us, eh? Being Roman citizens and... and, uh, uh, and uncondemned no let them come and get us out and so they quietly came and pleaded with them asked them to depart from the city and so they went out of the prison entered the house of lydia that's the seller of purple you might remember and when they'd seen the brethren they encouraged them and departed so now we come up to chapter 17 where did they go now when they passed through amphipolis and apollonia these are now were, uh, over there in, um, in Greece, uh, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, Paul, as his custom was, went into them. And for three Sabbaths, notice they are in there on the Sabbath day, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. Now, that was not the concept that uh, Jews had in those days. The Jews hated the Roman occupation. Much like my parents during the war hated the German occupation of Holland. They wanted to see these Romans kicked out. And they were hoping for the Christ to come as a victorious king <clears throat> and re-establish the kingdom of of David, because that was the promise, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people, the peacemaker, and he would cast the Romans out, and once again Israel would become the, the mighty nation it used to be. That was the plan. But Paul demonstrates that the Christ actually had to suffer. He would have gone, I, I would imagine, to to Psalm 22, where um, uh, King David cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The very words Jesus Christ used on the, on the cross. And then later on, they pierced my hands and my feet. This is all Psalm 22. Uh, and uh, indicating the kind of death that Christ would suffer. And they cast lots. They, they divided my clothing and cast lots for my vestry. 
And that's exactly what happened to Jesus' clothing, you see. And he would have used Isaiah chapter 53, talking about the coming, the one who would come and bear the sins of the nation. All of us like sheep have gone astray, verse 6 of Isaiah 53. We've, we've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. So that's talking about the Lord Jesus again. And he, would have, he could have gone to the, to the different places where the, the prophecy was that he would be born of a virgin, he would be born in, um, uh, in Bethlehem, that he was of the line of David, um, that uh, he was betrayed by a friend uh, that, uh, for 30 pieces of silver, and that the silver was used, was cast into the, into the uh, temple and was used to buy a potter's field. Um, there's a multitude of prophecies in the Old Testament all pointing to our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Anyway, he explained that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Yep, he would. That, that's very easy to prove from the prophecies of the Old Testament. And it used to be that uh, particularly the Muslims, uh, would say that these Old Testament prophecies were inserted by Christians later on, you see, as if the Jews would allow their their um, uh, their scriptures to be contaminated by Christians. But of course, then we had the, the 1948 discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the whole book of Isaiah, um, the every every book of the Old Testament was represented, except for the book of Esther, I believe, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, and they were they they, they have been um, dated, carbon dated as be, between 100 and 200 before Christ. So we know the scriptures were not contaminated by Christians afterwards. No, these. These Old Testament prophecies were written, <coughs> we know, sure, <coughs> were written before the Lord Jesus ever came. <coughs> and so Paul was saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded. A great multitude of devout Greeks. Now that's interesting, isn't it? A multitude of devout Greeks were already followers of Yahweh. They were already followers of um, the uh, of Judaism. Not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Uh, this is Thessalonica. And of course, the Apostle Paul later on writes the two epistles to the Thessalonians. The first and second Thessalonians was written after this. Anyway, but the Jews who were not persuaded becoming envious. Again, here they are. They're very, very jealous for their own religion because God had said, you are a special people unto me. They overlooked the passages of Scripture that uh, said that he would be a light to the Gentiles, for example, and the, the Gentiles would hope in him. They were overlooking those, or they were saying, oh, that had to be Gentile converts to Judaism. But they also overlooked the, the scriptures like uh, Jeremiah, who said, uh, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. Not like the old covenant, which your fathers didn't keep. No, this is a covenant that I'll write on your hearts. And that's the New Testament. That's what Jesus came to bring. And how, how he has poured his spirit uh, upon us. And yes, he's 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 put his Holy Spirit in and he's made our consciences alive to know what is good and what is evil. Um, and he's changed us. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, he's a brand new person. He's a new creation. The old is gone. New life has begun. Old things have passed away. Behold, he has made all things new. Okay, so they became envious. They took some of the evil men, and this is what happens when you 
when you start uh, uh, wanting to um, wanting to uh, protect something that you think is true by any means. And we see that in our, in our um, government uh, and in the particularly among, I believe, uh, those who hold to a cultural Marxist um, belief that um, the end justifies the means, which is absolutely anti uh, the Christian life. Don't ever allow that to become part of your psyche, that the end, even if it's a good end, justifies the means by getting there. So here they are. They have taken some of the evil men from the marketplace, gathering a mob, and set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. They sought to bring Paul and Silas out to the people, but when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These, oh, I love this sentence, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Oh, yeah. They knew very well that this, this good news, this gospel of the Messiah having come, was turning the world upside down in a good way. Oh, yes. These were, were people who loved everyone and that would lay down their lives for other people. So they bring them before the rulers of the city, saying, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. In other words, he's been hospitable, taken them in. These are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, and here's their pitiful reason, saying there's another king, Jesus. They knew very well that that wasn't the whole truth. Even Pilate, when Jesus, when he said, are you a king then? Jesus said, you rightly say I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. A king of a different world is no threat to the rulers of this world. So they were only giving half-truths. And you take a look at our Ministry of Propaganda, the mainstream media. They only ever give half-truths. And especially when they're talking about Christians. For the, for the last at least 30 years, anything they've ever had to say about Christians pretty much has been to put Christianity down. It's a Ministry of Propaganda. And... Um, why is this so? Well, it's because those who own the mainstream media are basically from, from four, it, it's a globalist thing, and basically four different people who hate Christianity, or four different groups, own the media. And that's why you can go to the media in the States, and they'll all be parroting the same thing, and mostly half-truths or out-and-out lies. They'll be parroting the same threat thing on every uh, TV that um, program or, or every channel you can think of. Um, I've seen it uh, done on, uh, it must be at least 25 different channels, and they all are given the same sentences to speak. Um, it's no longer that, that we have genuine journalism. No, we have propaganda. Much like uh, Goebbels uh, in Nazi Germany. And happily, there's people like myself who can go on um, uh, social media and hopefully, you know, bring a bit of balance to these things. Uh, and I say balance because if you take a look at the good Christians do, it's vast throughout the world. Where there's disasters, Christians are there. They're giving money. They are spending their time. They are rebuilding things. Uh, where there's a huge amount of HIV and AIDS around, 40% of those who are working with these people um, are Christian organizations. And yet they say, we hate the LGB community. They're just lying about Christians. Um, the, the ones who actually love people enough to stay with them right until their death, the ones at the bottom of the hill, um, uh, 
cleaning up a mess are genuinely and generally the ones that aren't government organizations, they're generally Christian organizations. Uh, but you won't hear that on the Ministry of Propaganda, I'm, I'm afraid to say. So I would say stop looking at mainstream media. It's just a Ministry of Propaganda and they're lying to you uh, as far as much of what's happening in this world is concerned, pushing their own agenda. But having said that, let's carry on what Jesus says in the Bible. Here's where you can find truth. They troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they'd taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Security being uh, they would have had to pay bail. That's modern day security. Let's read on. <clears throat> then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Now this is a better place. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica. And yet we don't have an epistle of, of the Apostle Paul uh, or other writings that, that exist now. They may have written to him, but they don't exist now as far as we know. An epistle to the Bereans. But we do have two to the uh, those uh, at uh, Thessalonica, the, the two epistles to the Thessalonians. Anyway, the ones at Berea were form, more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness. And what did they do? Search the scriptures daily. Guys, that's what we have to do. Get into the word on a daily basis to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few Greeks. There we are. The Greeks are also believing, uh, and prominent women as well as men. But take a look at these Thessalon Thessalonian Jews. But when the Thessalonian Jews learned that the word of God was being preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. These are people that have a zeal for Judaism, but they don't have a love for God. You say, how on earth is that possible? How can you have a zeal for Judaism but not have a love for God? Because they will use any means, any means, <coughs> to protect their particular religion against what they would consider a cult. If they had a love for God, they would do God's will. Anyway, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. But both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and received, received a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed. They departed. Paul at Athens one of the, perhaps the largest centers in Macedonia, in Greece. Let's see how Paul does in Athens. This is fascinating, guys. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked. Why? Within him, when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers. So he reasoned in the synagogue, yes, because these guys weren't idol worshippers. They were worshippers of God. But he, he started there in the synagogue with the Jews and with those Gentiles who were worship, also worshippers of Yahweh, of God of the Jewish God and of the Christian God, and in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. So on the one hand, he's reasoning with Jews who believe there's one God, but on the other hand, he's reasoning with people in the marketplace, anyone who's there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. Epicureans, both of these, uh, reasoned, and this was Greek philosophy, 
that the physical body was bad, that the spirit was good. Um, some of them reasoned that the almighty God couldn't have created man because man is wicked. Uh, we know that, that we, we all have fallen hearts. So they, that part they had right. But they considered that the body was evil, but the spirit was holy. The Epicureans then uh, reasoned their logic was like this. They said, well, it really doesn't matter what we do with the body because it's going to perish anyway. It's just, uh, you know, we can, we can live any way we like. Um, whereas the, because uh, the body is evil anyway. Um, and the Stoics, their reasoning was, no, we've got to uh, bring our bodies in subjection to what we know is right. And so they were, they were more like um, uh, people in the army, I guess, you know, where, where discipline was important, where the Epicureans, they could let themselves go. Anyway, so you had two different kinds of people here. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Uh, and that's a great word. Down here, you can see at the bottom, G, uh, babbler, liter literally a seed picker. Uh, like a bird picking its seeds. An idler who makes a living picking up scraps. There you go, a seed picker. Okay, what has this babbler got to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And so they took him and brought him to the Areop Areopagus. Uh, Ares, of course, is Mars. One's Greek, one's uh, Latin, or Rome, uh, yeah. So Aries is Mars, and of course we get uh, our planet Mars named after uh, the god of war. So the Areopagus, of course, is Mars Hill, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, but you're bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians, the Athenians, that's from Athens, notice, there's the word, and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Oh yes, they loved just to, this was their kind of gossip that they enjoyed hearing. And so they say, okay, let's hear what this guy's got to say. And so Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, uh, that's I. Let's take a look at what it says. I'm sure it'll say Mars Hill. I, Hill of Aries or Mars Hill. There we go. There we go. Okay. Stood in, in, in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Um, your, your Bible might say superstitious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an, found an altar, <coughs> pardon me, with this inscription, to the unknown God. What a way to introduce um, his message. <laughs> it just fits so well, doesn't it? The unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, let's take a look at what he says about him. This is how I introduced the gospel also, by the way. God who made the world and everything in it. I always start with that. God is the creator, the creator of the world and the good creator of the world. Evil wasn't in the world. God created everything good. But God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, <coughs> does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Now notice he immediately cuts to the heart of the, the Platonic idea, the, the, the Greek idea, because the body is evil, the God who made the, uh, the, the humans can't have been the 
ultimate almighty God. He must have had to be a lesser God, otherwise he, um, he wouldn't have created anything evil. As we know from scripture, he didn't create anything evil. So, Paul cuts to the heart of that. He says, no, it was almighty God. It was the God who created everything. That made us. He has made from one blood. Now that's important. From one blood, every nation of men who dwell to dwell on, the, on all the face of the earth. That tears away the whole idea of eugenics. Eugenics came from uh, and was, was encouraged by uh, Darwin's brother, I believe. Darwin, with the origin of the species, um, evolution, the evolution of all things, was made a popular theory. It falls apart, by the way, very, very easy to show that that whole theory and modern day evolution start, uh, don't go by Darwin's theory of evolution. They go by his theory, but they don't go by his, the, the evidence Darwin gave. Uh, natural selection cannot account for the changing of one species or one kind into another. You need uh, mutations and not just any mutation. You need mutations that actually increase um, the complexity uh, of, a, uh, of an organism uh, as well as give that organism new abilities. That's never, ever been seen. No, rather what we see is, is organisms that are already complete, whole, uh, made um, with the complexity they have, with everything operational. When something isn't operational in, in an organism, we say that's a mutation that takes away information. It's never a mutation that adds information. So when you look at organisms and the evolutionists will, will use these to show that they are useful um, uh, mutations, uh, beetles that are found on rocks where the wind blows in the ocean. And the beetles, their wings um, have not grown full. They're, they're stumpy wings and so they don't get blown off the rock. And so that's considered a good mutation. But what has it done? It's taken away the ability of the beetle to fly. They just crawl around on the rock and they, they can eat the food, whatever is, uh, uh, falls on the rock or whatever the tides bring in. Uh, and that's, that's shown to be a good mutation and proof of evolution. But of course, it's taking away information. It's not adding information, giving an organism new abilities. The, another one that they'll use, the evolutionists will use to prove uh, evolution is um, cave fish. Now fish that are uh, forever in the dark, their eyes become a, uh, a source of irritation and maybe death. So some of these fish have had uh, mutations and their eyes have been, um, the, 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 they're now hidden behind scales. In other words, they, they have become sightless. And that's a good thing for them, because when they bump their eye against the sides of the rock, uh, it doesn't become infected and they don't die. So they are the ones who have survived and have bred. And so you've got these sightless fish in the dark of caves, and they'll, they'll eat of the nutrients that come down the river. And that also is considered a positive or a, um, a helpful mutation. And so the fish changes. But you'll notice something here. In both cases, in all of those cases, and there's many others, um, the, the, what, what's happened is that the fish or the beetle or whatever it happens to be has lost an ability. And here in New Zealand, we've got um, uh, the largest parrot in the world, um, uh, kākāpō. 
uh, and the Kakapo has lost the ability to fly. It's got wings, uh, and no doubt at some stage it was able to glide or, or, or fly around, but because there were no predators on our island back in the day, no rats, no weasels, uh, no possums uh, that eat the eggs and so on, uh, it wasn't necessary for these birds to fly anymore. And what's happened is over the hundreds of years, they've lost the ability to fly. And you'll hear their, their booming mating calls, but uh, the male makes the nest, clears an area in the forest on the ground, and the females are attracted, and that's the way they reproduce. But now that we've got um, uh, rats and stoats and, and, and weasels and, and, and other predators, they have become endangered species and uh, we've moved them to various islands off the coast that are predator free so that they can still so that particular species can still survive now of course we know that thousands millions of species have passed away uh, and a good number of them because of humans and a good number of them not because of humans at all uh, you won't hear that side of the story either but anyway, um, there we are. Uh, what what we have is is, is uh, Darwin's idea uh, doesn't work just on um, natural selection. You can't keep on natural selecting and getting further and further away from the rootstock. Finches will always remain finches, for example. Uh, and unfortunately, we've never yet struck a um, uh, an organism that has any ability that the original organisms don't have. We 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 haven't seen anything like that in the in the hundreds of years we've we've uh, been digging up fossils and we've been looking at these. No. You, you you dig them up and you'll find that they're, they're the same in the modern day are virtually the same as the ones that existed before. When God says he made everything after its kind, that kind has stayed stayed that kind. Dogs have remained dogs. Got a vast um, a vast variety of dogs, absolutely. But dogs have remained dogs. Uh, and uh, it, True, some some you won't find uh, interbreeding. They're too small. The, the size is, is too different. Uh, that kind of thing. But uh, nonetheless, and the cat families also, you you, you can find that uh, lions and tigers can breed, and you get a liger or a tigon, depending on which is the male and which is the female. Anyway, uh, that's all by the by. We God is creator. That's the that's the important one here, guys. And yes, uh, they are getting back to the eugenics. Um, the, the thought was that different races uh, on, on our earth um, had evolved um, uh, at different rates. And, and so we had uh, races that are, are smarter and uh, stronger and um, uh, the the idea was let's get rid of the races that are weak or that are that seem unintelligent and and of course from that you had uh, the whole thought that oh let's go hunting the native people of australia the aboriginal people and uh they would go on these these abo hunts is what the, what they used to call them uh tasmania virtually has no aboriginals because they have, they went on these hunts, the, the, the early settlers, and wiped them all out. Uh, not just in Tasmania, but uh, the, the Aboriginals still exist in different parts of mainland Australia. Uh, just wickedness. And, and it all came from a false idea uh, of, of uh, evolution, a, a wicked idea, as it turned out. Because people would take into their hands that idea. Hitler did the same, by the way. He was going to, he was producing the master race. 
Uh, he was using natural selection to his advantage, he thought. And he would take the, uh, the, uh, the tallest and the whitest and the bluest eyes, and he would take them from Norway, he'd take them from my own uh, parents' country, the, the Netherlands. Uh, one of my, my, my dad's cousins, I believe, was taken over to, to Germany to breed with some of, the, um, some of the young women there to create this master race. And, um, but of course, what happens, the, 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 these women would have these children and by, by the end of the war, you had a, a heap of these, uh, uh, th these uh, young kids who didn't know who their, their, their father was. Well, what a terrible thing. And God later on, he says, he's put us in families, you know, for a reason. Um, but no, they, the whole idea that uh, that you can breed a super race and so on just goes dead against this. So, uh, and uh, we're we're not to to think that any race is lesser to the others. What has he done? He's made here. It says he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the, all the face of the earth. Well, science has finally caught up with the Bible, and they recognize um, that we all come from one mother. Uh, and that mother, of course, we know as Eve. Uh, and they call her Eve as well. They think it's maybe 20,000 years ago, but the, that the whole of the human race comes from one mother has now been established. Okay, he's made from one blood every nation of men. To dwell on all the face of the earth. Yes, we can give blood transfusions to one another from every every race, uh, as long as the, the you know you've got the uh, uh, same rhesus factor. Uh, well, you don't actually have to have the same rhesus factor. If you're if you're a positive, you can't give to someone who's a rhesus negative, but the negatives can give to the positive. Uh, oh. Um, the O factor can be, that's a universal donor, can give to the A's and B's. The A's and B's, or the AB's, uh, this, uh, you can have both factors, they are universal acceptors. In other words, they can take blood from anybody uh, because uh, they, they have those rhesus, the positive, and the A and the B. If you've got all three, I've got two, I've got positive and A, I can, I can receive blood from anybody except for the ones who are have the B factor. Uh, that's just a little bit of science for you. Anyway, he's made of one blood every nation to that, of men that dwell on the face of the earth. Hallelujah, he has. Every person is precious and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Why? So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Yes, God is right there. You want to cry out to him? He is right there. There's no place where God is not. He's not far from every one of us. In him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for well, we are also his offspring. Now, how do you figure that? We are his offspring. Well, we as Christians, we are born again. We are his offspring twice. How does that figure, you say? Well, if you take a look at the book of Matthew, and Luke, you will find there <coughs> the genealogy of our Lord Jesus. Well, you'll find the genealogy of Mary, and you'll find the genealogy of Joseph. And Joseph was Jesus' stepdad. In both of them, they can trace their genealogy back to King David, back to Bethlehem. That's why they had to go to Bethlehem because they were of the line, the lineage of David. 
But in one of them, you'll find that it goes through and it'll say David, the son of Jesse, uh, the son of Obed, and it'll just keep on going right back to Seth, the son of Adam. And then it says the son of God. Ah, so Adam was the son of God. That's the scripture. You can't go past the scripture. The scripture says so. And that's why the Apostle Paul could say, even your own poets have said the truth, for we are also his offspring. You see? If Adam was the son of God, and we are the children of Adam, then we are God's offspring by creation. But you and I, who have received Jesus as our Savior, and I'm hoping that's the case for you guys, I'll explain that a little later, you and I are also God's offspring by new birth. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. So we're God's offspring by new birth. We're his offspring twice. Um, why was that necessary? Why did we need to be redeemed? That's what you, when you take your watch and you go to a, to a shop that, uh, that says, okay, yeah, we'll give you $10 or we'll give you $100 for this thing. Uh, and look, if you come back within the next two months uh, and pay us an extra 10%, you can have your watch back. It's called pawning your watch or whatever it happens to be, your car or whatever. Ah, now, we were sold, the Bible says, we were sold under sin. But God has bought us back. He's redeemed us. And if you get your buy your watch back, you're, you're redeeming your watch. Just the same, we have been redeemed. We've been bought back. Okay, therefore, <clears throat> the apostle says, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the, div the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. No, nothing that man can create, not even with the most precious of metals, nothing that man can create is like God. No. Truly, these times of his ignorance God overlooked. But now, now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Yes, the command is towards all men. Jesus said to his disciples, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Yeah, that's the city. Judea, it's the province that Jerusalem was in. Samaria, even to the hated Samaritans. Oh yes, you're going to be my witnesses to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, and of course, at that time, it was the uttermost parts of the Roman Empire, even further. Uh, but now, we in New Zealand live in the uttermost parts of the world. Anyway, God has reached even to us. Hallelujah. These times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained. That's by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to judge the world in righteousness. It's not just going to be a, a, a frivolous, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. No, it's going to be a righteous judgment. Judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained. And he's given assurance of this to all. How has he given this assurance? By raising him from the dead. Ooh, now that's a hard one for them to swallow, as you can see. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. While others said, We'll hear you again on this matter. Okay. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius, the Areopagite, the one who hung around Mars Hill, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. 
So in Athens, we have a smallish group, even though it's a big city, and they love hearing this, that, and the other. And it seems to me like a lot of them were, you know, they they were well to do, and all they they um, they did was hang around talking about some new thing. And that's why they loved listening to Paul. But the urgency of what Paul says here, the urgency to repent. Now he commands all men everywhere to repent. That urgency didn't seem to be uh, felt by, by most of them. You believed? <clears throat> and these joined him. Now, we don't have any record of a, an epistle to the Athenians. No doubt the epistles, by the way, uh, to, the, uh, to the other cities that he was in, were copied and sent wherever there were Christians. Because we have so many ancient documents uh, of the writings of the New Testament, it's just embarrassing, you know, within the four, first five centuries or so, uh, you've got something like 25,000 documents and pieces of documents uh, that attest to um, the accuracy of the writings of the New Testament, and all written very close to when the original was written. Uh, so th the Christian has um, th that uh, on his side because these these things were that were written were considered God's word and were so important for Christians to have that they were copied left, right, and center, and many of them still survive right? um, from quite early on. Uh, so we come to the end of it, but. Um, Let's go back here to he commands everyone to repent. Um, what is this gospel that commands everyone everywhere to repent? And what does that word repent mean? The word repent mean, means a change of mind that leads to a change of life. The change of mind that word repent in Greek, metanoia. Uh, the word gnostic comes from knowledge or from mind. Uh, the gnostics were ones who felt they had greater knowledge than others. Uh, and unfortunately, they crept into the Christian church uh, and started bringing um, heresy into the church uh, as time went on. Um, but there's nothing wrong with tr with knowledge as long as it's correct knowledge. So metanoia, a change of mind, uh, means that they've changed their minds about who Jesus is and they've changed their minds about the, the kind of life they need to live. To repent is to turn, to change your mind, Turning to Christ, he becomes the Lord of your life. Well, how do we know that? Because when the apostle is writing, I think it's to the Ephesians, he says, <clears throat> he has delivered you from the domain of darkness. Okay, that's the domain where Satan is the god of this world. But he's delivered you from the domain of darkness or the dominion of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of the Son of his love. This is God the Father has transferred you from the domain of darkness, where you are under the rulership of Satan and of this world and of your own lusts, and he's transferred you into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And that's the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has transferred you into a kingdom. Now, a kingdom has a king. If you've been transferred into a kingdom, then you have a king over you. And that king is our Lord Jesus, kingdom of the son of his love. 
And that's why when it says he commands everyone to repent, it means that you start living like you have a king. In other words, Jesus is the king in your life. Who is on the throne of your life right now? Is it you that's calling the shots? I struggle with this, believe me. While we're in these bodies, there's a pull on us to sin. We have that. We all struggle with that, even in uh, old age, you know. Um, I remember um, Luis Palau. He's a, uh, an evangelist from South America. And he came to New Zealand probably 30 years ago now. And he was, he was saying, you know, it was a New Zealand guy that, um, uh, that mentored me when I was a young Christian. And as we were driving into the city, he said, stop here, Luis. We're going to pray. And why, why, why are we going to pray? He says, we're coming into a part of town, a red light district, and we don't want to be, to, to have anything uh, that, that would uh, cause us to sin, you know, in, in our minds uh, as far as seeing these prostitutes or the, the, the stuff uh, that they have on, on their shop windows and so on. So he was amazed because the guy that was mentoring was already about 70 years old. You think, and Luis was thinking, you need to do that? And uh, I tell you what, while we're in these, these bodies, um, this sinful flesh, as the, the Bible calls it, uh, the Apostle Paul, he, he says in, in Romans 7, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, guys, this repentance isn't just a once one off thing. This is this is daily just asking God to give you the strength to stand against the wiles of the enemy. Because Satan in a subtle way will try to drag you down. And God is faithful. You know, you ask him and he'll give you what you request. But you've just got to be willing because you have the indwelling Holy Spirit to give you strength to stand against the wiles of the enemy. Anyway, let's read on. Because he has appointed a day when he will judge the world. Amen. Jesus is coming. And when he comes, he's going to set up his kingdom here on earth. And you and I, the Bible tells us, we're going to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. You say to me, Mark, who on earth are we going to reign over? Well, that's the people, not the people that have been outright wicked, because the, the, the outright wicked ones, the Bible says, will be destroyed through the breath of Jesus coming. The wicked ones will be destroyed. They will have their day. And I would say many, many of our politicians uh, will be like that. Many who have, have uh, done the wishes, the wicked wishes, of uh, wicked rulers will be destroyed by the breath of God's coming. But probably what uh, the ones he's talking about who will we will reign over are those that perhaps haven't heard the good news. And we need to tell people the good news, don't we? We need to tell people that there is a saviour. There is someone who can change us to become more Christ-like. And that's what repentance means. We turn to God and we say, Lord, I want to become more Christ-like. I'm in your kingdom. You're my king. You're the Lord of my life. Change me to be, be that kind of person that you want me to be. I want to do what is right. You can do that. You can do that right now if you haven't already done it. As many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures foretold. He was buried, he rose again, just as the scriptures foretold. Yes, and he's now at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's at the right hand of God the Father. Ever there, 
to intercede for us. He took the death we deserved. The wages for sin is death. Christ paid the wages. We are such blessed people. And yet there are those, amazingly, that you can tell them this, and they say, mm, no, no, I'm young. Uh, I, I, I want to sow my wild oats. I want to, you know, have some fun first before I come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they don't realize that in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, pleasures forevermore. Walk with the Lord. That kind of life is exciting. That kind of life is fulfilling. And that's what God wants for us. Hey, enough on that. Um, thank you so much for joining me this morning. I pray God's wonderful and rich blessing on you all. And we'll end the stream here. God bless.